We praise you, Jesus. Touch us tonight, Jesus. Move on us. We long for you. We long for you. We worship you. We're in great need of you. So even tonight, feed us with your own hands, I pray. God, I ask you, make my voice tonight so like unto thine that even the weakest sheep will hear it and follow you. In your precious name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah. Man, I feel the Lord so close to us tonight. If you can, turn to Luke chapter 22. We're going to jump into the scriptures here. I heard the Lord for the room tonight. I was asking him what he wanted to say, and he showed me this, something very special. Oh, we're, I'm, I use the NASB. It's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> he said it's good I passed the test so I was asking the Lord obviously it's the men's conference and I said Lord what, you know what, what am I supposed to share there's going to be people in, in this room that have walked with God longer than I've been alive there's going to be people in this room that just got born again recently uh, Lord what am I supposed to to share tonight and I saw the Lord and he was the table, the table in the upper room, and around the table was just men, and the, the table got so long that there were so many men. It went so long, every man in this room could sit at the table, and I, I heard the Lord say this, tell them I have eagerly desired to eat this meal with them, Amen. and to, to me, I I think sometimes about the emotions of God. And this one is eagerness, excitement, desire, smiling, bright-eyed desire. Tell them I want to eat with them. That's what I felt like Lord was really inviting us all to tonight, myself included. Again, I'm not here as a doctor, but a fellow patient. I feel the Lord is saying, eat with me. You say, Eric, how do, you know, what does that have to do really with sonship? Well, sons are the perpetual recipients of God. That's what they are. They are those who are seated at the table of the Lord. And um, tonight, many of you have probably already been touched by during this incredible worship tonight. This team is amazing. You guys are blessed. It's not just good, it's not just good worship, it's good sound and good musicians and it was wonderful. But maybe you've already been touched tonight. Maybe you had a, a massive touch from the Lord recently. There's this quote from Jesse Penn Lewis I felt was very good to start with. And it says, however full and blessed our past experiences have been, its power depends upon a fresh inflow of divine life. You say, Eric, what does that actually mean? It means the Lord has set you free, right? The power of that freedom or the continuation of that freedom is dependent upon consistently receiving that same Christ. Uh, this is so important for us because oftentimes we think God just wants to break deliverance off for us, hand it to us, and then go on your way, go on your way. But when you read the book of Hosea, he doesn't want to break deliverance off and hand you deliverance and give you deliverance. He wants to be your deliverance. So that he himself, you holding and clinging to him, is your deliverance. If he delivered us from anything, it's a life apart from his presence. I mean, you may think, you know, he delivered me from drugs. He delivered me from, you know, promiscuity or alcoholism. or all. I mean, praise God for those things. But those are far second. He delivered you from not being able to sense his presence. Not be led by the power of his voice. And not have going into you God himself. Praise God. So this is what we want to look at. Luke chapter 22, verse 15. These are... Jesus' words, and I'm going to read just the first couple of these words in verse 15. It says, and he said to them, I have earnestly, eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. That is what I believe the Lord is saying. I believe that's the word of the Lord. I have eagerly desired to eat with you 
tonight. See, I, I often, I'm an itinerant preacher, so this is what I do. I go around and, and strengthen the churches. And I can't bring myself to emphasize a result over the source. Um, what that means is I can't stand up here and preach about secondaries when there's a primary person. I, I want to I emphasize this man, Christ Jesus, because from him flows all these things. And I find a lot of times we slip into these traps where we emphasize the results of the person instead of the person who brings the results. And sometimes it gets, it's a very frustrating thing because if you're seeking the results instead of the person, then when you're not able to obtain the results because the results are in the person, then you get upset because you don't have the results. But the reality is if you just forget the results, in a sense, and just look at the person and the results will take place. <laughs> A.W. Tozer has written an absolute classic. If, you have, if you're a reader in this room, I highly recommend you read The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. Uh, to me, it's one of the greatest things ever written by men. And he actually says this in there. He says, a thousand problems are solved all at once when Christ takes his proper, proper place. And that's what we're talking about. When Jesus introduces a, a table to us, when he invites us to a table, he's inviting us to sit with him, be in his presence, hear his voice, Eat of him, drink of him, praise God. The per perpetual recipients of God, that's what we are. If sons are anything, yes, sons are free, praise God. But sons above all receive God consistently and they live this way. You notice when Jesus right here wants to show them the new covenant. Think about this for a second. This blows my mind, this, this whole picture. Jesus wants to explain and expound what the new covenant is. You guys know there's an old covenant and a new covenant. Jesus came to inaugurate the new covenant. That the old covenant is pointing to this new covenant. And then inside the new covenant, you can see the, 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 ap, the actual pictures of it in the old covenant. Jesus comes to reveal the new covenant. And this is how he chooses to unveil, explain the new covenant and how it works. He says, bread, break, eat it. Drink, wine, drink it. It's a meal. You're eating bread you're drinking the wine. This is at a table with the Lord. This is his chosen imagery to express and explain to us what the new covenant is. To eat with him. To dine with him. The scripture says in Luke, it says, uh, in, I think it's Luke 21, he says that the kingdom of heaven is like a feast. <laughs> it's, you're invited to dine at this table to receive into yourself this bread. Turn over to, to John 6. Let me just show you another portion here that speaks of this eating because it's so important in John chapter 6 you see this interesting picture you have read this before I'm sure um, after these things Jesus went away to the other side of the sea of Galilee and a large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing then Jesus went up on the mountain and he sat down with his disciples look at this the Passover feast of the Jews was was near look at this Jesus lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him said, where can we buy bread for these to eat? I want you to notice something. Jesus sees people coming to him, and the first thing on his mind is, how I want to feed them. <laughs> this is the same way he is today. You come to Jesus, the first thing he has on his mind is, let me feed you. I want to be bread for your soul. I want to give you drink. I want to give you sustenance. Come to my table and let me feed you. This, let me feed you is saying so much to us because when he feeds us, he installs the nutrients necessary to walk out his nature. He's implanting life on the inside of us by this bread. You know, in 657, you go down to 57, look at what he says here. This is absolutely astounding. As the, as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. Look at this. So he who eats me will also live because of me. In other words, your life supply, the vitality of your Christian life, the vitality of your love for the Lord, the vitality of your desire for the scriptures and love for evangelism and preaching, the, all that life comes from eating the Lord. I want you to think about it like this. This helps me a lot. It's like God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are going to make humanity. The whole plan is arranged, and they're talking, and they say, they're going to need a way to understand what we are for them. 
Therefore, let's create them as humans with this principle in their bodies that they've got to eat and drink in order to survive. And then when I come, I'll stand in front of them and I'll say, I am food for you. I am drink for you. (laughs) He pre-planned this whole understanding so that you could see how deeply and desperately you need consistently to receive of God. Sons are the perpetual recipients of God. We need this. You know, some of us are, are so focused on a leading that we forget the feeding. <laughs> you know, if, you, if you're focusing on being led, I'm telling you, just focus on being fed. And then in the feeding, you'll find the leading. This is so important for us because, you know, the scripture says in 1 John 5, 12, it says, he who has the son has life. He who has not the son has not life. You know, what does it say in John 10, 11, Jesus says, I've come that you may have life. I want to give you vitality. You know, when I, when I was growing up, I grew up in the church. My dad was a pastor all my life. I never got into anything. I never, never did drugs, never was an alcoholic, nothing like, nothing like this, never did anything before marriage. I was just a PK kid, and I, I lived a, a real clean life. But here's the thing. I was going to hell just like everybody else yeah. <laughs> because Jesus didn't come to make bad men into good men. He came to make dead men live. Yeah. If you've never done anything wrong, you've done everything wrong. You're both going to hell because you don't have life. The scripture is showing us this, that you don't need God because you're bad. You need God because you're dead. And we are the sons of God who are perpetual recipients of God. He installs this principle on the inside of us. In Matthew 26, verse 26, Jesus, look at this picture. Jesus stands up and he takes the bread. They're there. They can hear him. They can see him. They're in his presence. Then he breaks the bread and he gives it to them. This is a picture of what it is to eat. We must be in his presence And then he feeds us himself with his word. We drink of him through worship. This beautiful picture of his presence opens up the ability to imbibe. God makes himself edible in his presence. Praise God. He is bread for us. The scripture says man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds. It's the living voice, the the speaking of God coming out. This is so rich for us because Jesus is trying to to tell us how to live successfully how to live in vitality and in life. And so this life is so important. So he feeds us in his presence. And I feel like what the Lord is even saying tonight is here I am, will you ingest me? (laughs) Will you eat me? Will you receive me as a life supply? Will you drink of me? Does he not say to us, he who drinks of me will never thirst again? Does he not say he who eats of me will never hunger again? In other words, I want to be all your satisfaction. A.W. Tozer writes this, he says, God made us for himself that we might know him, live with him, and enjoy him forever. I don't know about you, but I enjoy food. (laughs) Eating is a pleasurable experience. Have you ever been super thirsty? (laughs) You ever been super thirsty? You ever drank when you were very thirsty? You are literally like, there's something happening to my body right now that I can't explain. (laughs) This is incredible. This drink and this eating Jesus has made beforehand so that we could recognize that in in eating the Lord and enjoying the Lord are exactly the same thing. As you enjoy the Lord, you're eating the Lord. As you eat of the Lord, you enjoy the Lord. And I want to tell you, enjoyment is the purest form of seeking God. You know, uh, striving is the curse. Enjoyment's the covenant. To enter in, break, hear, eat. You know, the Bible is the only book that demands the author be present when it's read. And in the presence of the Lord, this book turns into bread. You know, when I was was working for uh, Reinhard Bunke, I would find places to eat my lunch. And one day I grabbed my lunch and I just tried to find a picnic table. And I, I found this empty picnic table. I sat down and then right after I got there, all these people came and they sat at the same table with me. I don't know them. And I was just like, oh man, this is gonna be not what I wanted. But then they start opening up these books and they're talking. And I realized quickly that they're exchanging recipes with each other and they're showing pictures of food. They were culinary students. But the thing was, is I was the only one that actually had food at the table. <laughs> See, you can learn all there is about food and not eat it. You can have pictures of food and not eat it. <laughs> and so many Christians are like this. 
They live their lives being able to talk about the Bible. They can talk about the Bible or, or they can tell people testimonies of what's happened. But the imbibing and the eating is not the, their way of life. It's, it's easy to slip into the, the club of Christianity. Slip into the mode, sign at the dotted line, this is what I am as a Christian. Are you eating? If you stop eating, I'm telling you, you're not enjoying the covenant. If you stop eating, you're going to start seeing some types of symptoms in your life. You're going to have secret sin. Because you're not going to be able to get over it. I tell people all the time, if you're struggling with sin, eat. Because as you eat the Lord, you're going to find satisfaction happens on the inside. John Piper said it like this, sin is what we do when we're not satisfied with God. You, you need a full tummy. That's what, you, that's what your problem is. Eric, I can't overcome this sin. Get your tummy full. Eat the word of God. Drink the word of God. Drink, the, drink, him, drink his presence, the presence of the spirit. You know, live in this place of perpetually recipient. That's a son. And that's where deliverance happens. You say, Eric, but I I am eating. I am eating, but I'm still struck. Keep eating. Keep eating. You'll find that as you keep coming to the Lord, you'll find the Lord just kind of breaks these things off little by little in your life. Do you remember what happens after Peter falls? What does he do? Jesus tells him, you're going to deny me. He does deny him, just like he said he would. And then you know the next time Jesus and Peter see each other, Jesus is on the shore. Do you remember this? Peter gets to the shore, and what's the first thing Jesus says to him? I can't believe you actually did what I prophesied. (laughs) Did he look at him and be like, hey, listen, everybody come over here. Peter, you stay over there. No, he looked at Peter, and then he goes, come have breakfast with me. This is what he's saying. Come eat with me. Maybe you're here, and you fell recently. Maybe you're here, and you feel like you just can't get over some type of, listen, Jesus is looking at you saying, will you eat with me? He's not saying, get away from me. He's saying, come and eat with me. Come enjoy with me. The innocent a trap is to focus on, yes, the results of enjoying God instead of just enjoying God. You know, some, I remember I heard this woman say one time, I need more patience. I need more patience. And I looked at her and I said, why don't you forget patience and enjoy God, and then he'll be patience in you. <laughs> and, you know, we're always talking about, I'm working on my love. You listen, forget working on love. Enjoy God, and he'll be love on the inside of you. It's just because, you know, you need to eat. You need to eat in order to have nourishment. Religion demands uh, God's nature from you, but stops you from having the nourishment that gives you the nutrients that are necessary for that nature. So when we eat... We receive these things. I believe that the church needs to change her mind. I think she needs to see that the, the secret is not how much she works, but how much she eats. Because as the church eats, this overflow begins to happen. This life supply begins to happen. The enjoyment of God is where enlightenment comes from, where you begin to see what God is like. Everything depends on his presence. Have you, have you noticed this? In your life, everything depends on his presence. With, with his presence, everything seems to be right. Without his presence, everything seems to be wrong. How I many of you know what I'm talking about? But that's why we come to his table, because we make his presence the primary thing when we come to his table. Only the enjoyment of God. If you don't, if you don't remember anything that I say tonight, remember this statement. Only the enjoyment of Christ can keep you in right relationship with God. It is only the enjoyment of Christ that can keep you in right relation with God. It is this enjoyment that glorifies God. Why? Because glorifying God is dependent upon fruit, and fruit is dependent upon life. There's no fruit on the tree, you know there's no life in the vine. But if the tree bears forth fruit, it's indicative of life. So if you're gonna glorify God, you need fruit, If you're going to have fruit, you're going to need life. And life is dependent upon enjoying fellowship with God. I've seen, many of you have seen more of this than I have, but I've seen many people fall away from the Lord. People that were genuinely delivered. I saw it. I was there. I've seen the power of God come upon them. And then they go 15 years or they go 10 years and, and they're no longer believing in the Lord anymore. How many of you have seen this? This comes from... Not enjoying the Lord. 
you know, there's, there's this story of the giving tree. Anybody ever heard of this? Yes. Yeah. There's a couple of people in here that have heard of it. But I'm going to tweak the story a little bit to emphasize my point. There's a little boy who would go to this tree, and the tree would say to the boy, come, boy, swing on my branches, eat of my apples, lay in my shade. Let's enjoy uh, life together. And the boy would do it, swing on the branches, he'd eat of the apples, and he would lay in the shade. And then the boy starts to not come to the tree as much as he used to, and he starts to grow up. And as he grows up, he goes back to visit the tree, and he says to the tree, or the tree says to him, come on, boy, just swing on my branches and eat of my apples and lay in my shade. The boy says, I'm a little older now. I, you know, I don't have time for all that, in, that enjoyment. I, I, I need a house. Or actually, he says, I need, I need, I need, I need money. That's what I need. That's what I need. I'm a little older now. I need money. I, can't, I don't have time for enjoyment. I need money. And the tree says, well, I don't have any money to give you, but you can take my apples and you can sell them. And then you'll have money. So the kid takes all the apples, sells them, gets money, doesn't come back to the tree for a while. But when he does return to the tree, the tree says, come boy, and lay in my shade and swing on my branches. And the boy says to him, I'm a little older now. Now I've got a wife and I've got kids. You know, I don't have time for all that enjoyment. He's like, I, I, I need a house. You got a house for me? And the tree says, I don't have a house for you, but you can cut my branches off. And then you can make a house for yourself. So he cuts all the branches off the tree. He makes a house for himself. He comes back years later and the tree says to him, why don't you come and lay down in my shade? The boy says, I'm, I'm older now. I just want to get away from everything. I need a canoe. And the tree says, I don't have a canoe for you, but you can cut me down. You can make a canoe. And you can go where you need to go. The boy cuts the tree down, makes a canoe out of him, leaves. And then later, the very end of his life, he comes back to this tree that he used to enjoy. And he, it's not even there anymore. The whole point of the story is this. When you stop enjoying God, you start using God. And here's the crazy thing about God, and I don't know why he's like this, but he'll let you do it. And this is a trap many people fall into. And then before you know it, they, they're mighty in power. They've got all kinds of miracles behind them, and they don't have any more enjoyment of the Lord. But I want to reach to us tonight and spare us from this kind of thing because sons are perpetual recipients of God. We eat of the Lord. We drink of the Lord. There's a, there's a big difference between results and fruit. A big difference. One comes from life. The other one doesn't come from life. You know, in Psalm 23, you've, you've read this many times, but there's this statement. You've probably seen it on a plaque in somebody's house. You, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You notice it's the Lord is wanting to eat with David. The Lord prepares a table. That's a place to eat for David in the presence of his enemies. I mean, think about this picture for a second. David's enemies are not, you know, trolls on the internet. David's enemies are not people leaving bad comments or even mailing something, you know, derogatory to his home. His Enemies have real swords, real shields, real bows and arrows. They have real weapons and they can really damage you and kill you. If you've ever read the Old Testament, it's really gruesome cutting off king's hands and feet and head and sticking them to the wall so everybody knows. You come over here, this is what happens to you. This is real army, real war, real blood, real death, real fear. And the scripture says there that in the presence of mine enemies, think about this picture. There they are, Jesus and you are standing there and you're surrounded by enemies with real weapons and real swords and you're shuddering and you look to the Lord and you say, oh Lord, do something, uh, blow on them or something. And the Lord goes like this, he lays out a blanket and then he goes, oh, you want a Coke or you want a sandwich? And you're like, Lord, do you see what's going on? He's, yeah, you, I'm asking you if you want peanut butter or jelly. or what is, And you're literally freaking out. And there he is making a table for you right in the presence of your enemies. What does that mean? It means that no matter what problem you are so afraid of or one, what thing is pressing upon you, it doesn't matter what's coming against you in your life, the Lord's one question is, will you eat with me? Will you eat with me? You say, Eric, you don't know where my bank account is is right now what the Lord says to you tonight, will you eat with me? You don't know what's going on with me and my wife. The Lord is saying, will you eat with me? 
You say, Eric, I just, um, I got, I don't know where to go in my life. The Lord is saying, will you eat with me? This is what is on his mind to feed you, that you would find in him everything that's necessary. And we learn quickly by the way that Jesus operates with us that the essential Christian message is not behave, but behold. It's not just try to get your life in order. It's be with me and I'll do the rest. We were joking earlier today and he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. It's, it's Christ doing that work, that deep work on the inside. And I find in my life that, uh, you know, I travel with Reinhard Bunky for a long time. I was working with him. I don't know if you know that name. But he used to say to me all the time, Christianity is not to be endured. It's to be enjoyed. And coming from a man like that, it's, it's, it really means a lot. That the enjoyment of God, that's what this whole thing is all about. If we, if we stop enjoying him, we stop eating of him. If we stop eating of him, then we start seeing all kinds of things start lacking in our lives. You know, satisfaction is not just some perk. It's the very means by which he frees you and empowers you to be able to obey him. He does this work in you, both to will and to do. I remember reading Charles Spurgeon said, grace is all sufficient and always accessible, but there's one dispensable, one dispensing place. It's the feet of the Lord going straight to Jesus. He says, come to me, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your soul. This is the work that, that Christ does. But Mr. Competition, Mr. Comparison, Mr. Recognition, Mr. Self-Awareness, these are all assassins of your enjoyment of God. You know, am I going to be seen? Am I going to be, do, do people know that I'm seeking you? You know, it's, it, it has to be about enjoying the Lord. And that, and it ends right there because that's the highest place there is the devil wants to put obstructions between you and enjoying the lord why because an unsatisfied heart is an idol factory it just creates idols just creates stuff to put in front of the lord when your heart is not satisfied with god and then we start getting often we get impatient when we when we're not interested in the movement of the spirit you know i remember lindell cooley said during the browns revival he said I don't want to offend God's spirit by just rushing on. And I think that goes for normal life, too. It's like, I don't want to offend the spirit of the Lord because I'm just going to rush on. You know, you're secondary to me. But if he's primary, then it means all that matters is, am I connected? Am I connected to you? I don't want to lose connection with you. I want to eat consistently and drink consistently. So impatience is really disinterest in the dove. That's what it is. Haste, you know, it only leads to waste. Oswald Chambers said, rush is always wrong. (laughs) Haste leads to waste. Rush is always wrong. But to sit, that's why when you go to the table, you sit. Jesus didn't have, you know, know, a drive-by, you know, come by, grab your bread and go. (laughs) You sit down with the Lord. Take take time to sit with him. You say, Eric, I don't have much time. Well, you give him whatever you do have, and the Lord can work in your life. If you give him nothing, there's nothing for him to work with. If 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 you're beating yourself up about work, And trying to make time for the Lord. Think about it like the parable of the talents and the pounds. Do you remember this? Some one guy's given five, another one two, one is given one. Do you remember this? And they they invest the talents, and according to what they invest, God gives them back to them. And there's one guy that doesn't invest his talent. He doesn't give what he has. And even though he has little, he doesn't get anything back from the Lord. In the same way, time, whatever time God has allowed you to have in your life. Sowing that into him will always bring increase in the knowledge of God. I remember Walter Butler, he he once said a statement. He said, um, he said, time is the tuition in the school of the spirit. Taking time to be with the Lord. He said, Eric, I don't have much time. Well, you give him what you have and it's very valuable. Remember the woman with two mites? She only had two mites, but she gave more than people who gave 50 mites. Why? Because it's what she had. She gave what she had. And so the Lord looks at your time like this. If you have 40 minutes, if that's all you have in a day, and you give that to him, to God that means a lot. It it, it means more to him than somebody who gives five hours if he has all day. Does that make sense? So I'm just saying, I'm I'm trying to encourage you in in this way. So we just want to stay patient with the Lord. And patience with the Lord is really an issue of satisfaction. 
Being patient is remaining satisfied with God. Impatience comes from not being satisfied with God because it's lack of contentment with the Lord. Really, to hurry God is to find fault with Him. But to have in your heart this, this satisfaction means that you don't, you don't fashion idols. So He gives us Himself and, and we find in Him all that we're looking for. The last thing I want to kind of share with you guys, which is a, uh, just feel is very important, is when you go to spend time with the Lord, I think you should really think about it just like you do when you eat. If the imagery that he gives to us of the new covenant is eating with him, you can really grab a hold of that imagery and bring it into your closet. So you say, Eric, how do I do this eat? How do I, you're talking about eating. I, I recognize it's important to eat. I, I need to be a perpetual recipient of God. I need to have that divine life in me if I'm going to have fruit. I realize he's given me bread and he's given me wine. How do I do it? Well, first, I would encourage you to take time to sit with the Lord, which means you're not doing anything else but sitting with the Lord. You see, if there's no time and place, you'll never do it. But if you sit with the Lord, take time to sit with the Lord, then right there you have a platform for the food to be enjoyed and what the food looks like is just like this when you sit down to eat what you do is you sit there and then what you do is you you cut your food up you know and then you put that food in your mouth and you chew it do you not and then as you chew it then you swallow it down maybe you take a drink after maybe you drank a little bit before you're drinking it throughout the whole thing as you cut chew swallow drink cut chew swallow drink this is how you are eating and in the same way being with god is the same way you rest Fully accepted, fully connected, and then you begin to read the scriptures. That's, that's cutting your food. Read the scriptures. And then you don't want to just read the scriptures. You want to meditate upon the scriptures. That's how, you put the, that's how you start chewing the food. If you just read, all you do is cut. That's no good. <laughs> you want to cut the food and then meditate upon the scriptures. Eat, chew them so that you're able to get them inside you. And then worship is, is drinking that, that wonderful wine. You could, you could look at swallowing like prayer. That's how you get the thing that you read into you. John Bunyan said, I never know a thing well until it's burned into my heart by prayer. So let's hear it as you sit down, you begin to read the scriptures, you're, you're cutting, and you take that section that you, you just read, that chapter you read, then you begin to think about that. What, does it, what is this trying to tell me? Don't try to tell the Bible what's there. Let the Bible tell you what's there. Don't try to look and find what you already know here. Let this tell you the new things to know. And then right there you take that chapter and you just begin to chew it up, think about it. Wow, wow, yeah. You're thinking about this thing. And as you begin to understand what's going on, then you begin to pray it out. And oh Lord, Lord, make me understand that. And I just pray that for my family. You begin to pray it out so it gets down on the inside of you. Oh, I worship you. Pray. That's a little drink. I worship you, Lord. Thank you. I worship you. You drink. Then you go back down, read a little bit more, cut some, and you meditate upon it. You know, pray in the spirit. You know, pray that thing down, and then drink. Oh, I worship you, Lord. These three, these things are happening simultaneously, consistently. These are the three golden pipes through which the golden oil flows: worship, the word, and prayer. And this is the enjoyment of the Lord. I, I, when, in my personal opinion, there is nothing higher than this. I, I can't find anything that can be done on this planet that is as gloriously lifting and wonderfully fulfilling and blissful as this, the enjoyment of his presence. And the more you do this, the more you'll find that you, you, you just begin to get fatter and fatter in the spirit, if you will. You get thicker and thicker, stronger and stronger in the spirit. But... Um, uh, there, Madame Guyon writes this. She says, when you're quiet before the Lord, simply allow yourself time to enjoy his presence and to be filled full in your spirit. Hearing is a passive rather than an active procedure. Rest, she says, rest. Rest in God's love. Simply listen and be attentive to God. These passive actions will permit God to communicate his love to you. When your spirit is centered on God, all the activity he initiates will be so full of peace and natural and so spontaneous that it will appear that you are hardly doing anything at all. Say, so Eric, why are you saying this? Because I really feel it is so important that we recognize God is inviting all of us to the table to eat 
and to live by this eating. Sons are perpetual recipients of God. We've been invited to the table to eat of the Lord. This is the way he explains and expounds the new covenant. Enjoyment is the issue. Enjoyment will protect you. Enjoyment will keep you. I'm telling you, if you are constantly dealing with competition, you're always thinking of comparison, you need to enjoy the Lord and you'll forget all about everybody else. You'll find you do more on accident than you ever did on purpose by being in his presence. But the the thing is, the problem about this kind of thing is that men love to explain rather than adore. Men seek explanations, but Christ is seeking adoration. Explain to me, explain to me. I, I, wanna, I wanna work it all out. You know, tell me, tell me how it works. Instead of just saying, oh Lord, only you know. I trust in you. You are my, you're my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all and my all. A bunker used to tell me also, he used to say, God, remember, God gave himself for you so he could give himself to you. What a wonderful gospel. God gave himself for you that he might give himself to you. See, I have a great need for Christ, but I have a great Christ for my need. Praise God. It's wonderful to realize, it's wonderful to realize that uh, um, <laughs> you stand before God as Christ because Christ stood before God as you. That's a wonderful gospel reality that makes everything so much more fun. You can have full access to God. So the, the last thing I'll say, uh, the, the band or whatever can come back up. But I want to tell you one last story to really illustrate uh, what I believe to be the highest thing that we're able to do. And it is this, this adoration. When I was first born again, uh, Mark can testify to this, we just prayed in tongues like crazy. And we yelled. <laughs> I remember reading A.B. Simpson He said, people who are always yelling at God must live really far away from him. (laughs) Well, when I first got born again, that's all we did, you know? And I I got picked up for a road trip by an older man of God. Praise God for older men of God. I want to tell you, if you're an older man of God in this room, the younger generation needs you so bad. You don't even realize it. I, I make a point to go hang out with men that are 10, 15, 20, 30 years older than me and just talk to him, listen to him. I beg them to be my friend so I can drink from them. And sometimes with these older men, and some of you are in here, and this is kind of an indirect rebuke, they, you guys feel like you don't really have something to give. And we, the, I gotta try to pull it out. Like, tell me, talk to me, tell me. I, I wanna encourage you, if you're an older man of God in this room, just give your jewels to the, to the younger men. Pass it, give it, give it to them. Invest in the success of the younger ones. Give, give, your, give your life and your, your life lessons to them. We're longing for it. I'm longing for it. Um, but so this older man of God picks me up and he says, let's pray as we're driving down the road. And I did the only thing I knew to do. I was like, you know, rocking back and forth, throw us a bone, God. You know, I'm crying out. And he's just quiet. He's waiting for me to get tired. He knew I wouldn't be able to hold that up for very long. So after I'm tired and I stop praying, he waits for the smoke to clear for my all-out assault on everything. And he did something that changed my life forever. With a steering wheel in one hand and a steaming coffee in the other, this old man goes just like this, and I'm going to do it. He said, Jesus, I worship you. And he waits. He goes, I give you honor, Lord. There's no one like you. He just waits. I worship you. Just like this. Waiting. I worship you. I start weeping next to him. I'm weeping for two reasons. One, I can feel the presence of the Lord. Two, I was really frustrated at how easily he touched God. I learned a very valuable lesson that day. And if you don't know this lesson already, then take this like a golden coin. Keep it in your pocket forever. One ounce of adoration is worth tons and tons of efforts and striving. 
I worship you. you. Say, Eric, I have such a hard time connecting with God. Worship him. Worship him. Forget yourself. The biggest problem when you're in the room is you. You're so focused on your own presence, you can't recognize God's presence. If you'll forget yourself and go up. This is where worship brings you up into the high place. As Charles Spurgeon said, he gives you wings like eagles to fly above the storm. Praise God, to be up there with him. The bliss of his presence. Praise you. You guys want to stand with me real quick? Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. We praise you. We praise you, Father. Thank you. Can we just begin to just softly pray? Just begin to ask the Lord to do something in your life here. Say, Lord, I I hear your invitation to to eat with you. I choose. I choose to be one who eats. And if if you've fallen recently, just see the Lord saying, come eat breakfast with me. Come on. Come eat with me. Praise you.